section twelve of sikh religion volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe life of guru gobind singh chapter twelve we now come to further objections made by the hindus to the khalsa they said it is impossible to observe the rules of the khalsa how can the four castes dine together were we to accept the guru's words there would be no trace of caste left in the world the guru hath confounded the four castes he hath stirred water with a dagger and called it nectar no matter who cometh to him he associateth with him without distinction of caste and without regard for the duty prescribed for his stage of life he hath renounced the veds and the popular beliefs and only believeth in acid huge of whom we have never before heard and who is not known even to pandits the learned men among the hindus preach of ram krishan and the other incarnations recorded in the purans and adhere to the ancient religions brethren this khalsa is a new-fangled institution for which we have no scriptural authority it is the guru who hath introduced this absurdity and informed the world that there is only one caste he hath broken the sacrificial thread of brahmans and khatris and by causing them to eat together hath brought discredit on ancient customs sanctioned and hallowed by religion he hath ordered us not to give our daughters in marriage to any one who cutteth his hair so smitten is he with affection for his khalsa that he hath rejected not only the hindu but the muhammadan religion he hath prohibited tobacco pilgrimages and periodical oblations to the manis of ancestors the guru wrote to his sikhs wherever they resided to come and accept baptism and become members of the khalsa he warned those who failed to do so that they should afterwards regret it when they met with affliction they would be glad to seek the protection of the khalsa but this could only be obtained by their acceptance of baptism and by their repentance and submission the holy khalsa would then remove their entanglements and accept them as brothers in the faith on this great occasion the hill chiefs including raja ajmar chand the successor of the late bim chand went to visit the guru ajmar chand said it is thou who hast instituted the khalsa religion by thy power and greatness all the turks shall be destroyed the guru replied if thou be baptized and become a sikh thy glory shall increase tenfold ajmer chand inquired what the marks of the guru's sikhs were that is how they could be recognized the guru replied my sikhs shall be in their natural form that is without the loss of their hair or foreskin in opposition to ordinances of the hindus and the mohammedans in reply to ajmer chand's further inquiries the guru informed him of the acts allowed and disallowed his sikhs ajmer chand replied great king we must worship our idols and shave on the occasions of deaths in our houses this is ordained by our religion the guru replied if hair were not pleasing to god why should he have caused it to grow in giving the baptismal nectar i change you from jackals to tigers my sings shall destroy all oppressive pathans and mughals and rule in the world ajmer chand said that is impossible each turk can eat a whole goat how can we who only eat rice cope with such strong men 
the guru replied my singhs too are permitted to eat flesh and one of them shall be able to hold his ground against one hundred thousand turks i will kill hawks with sparrows o raja have no anxiety i shall make men of all four castes my singhs lions and destroy the mughals if thou too embrace my faith and become a singh thy realm shall abide the guru's teaching had the magical effect of changing a pariah or outcast through an interminable line of heredity into a brave and staunch soldier as the history of the sikh mazabi regiments conclusively proves this metamorphosis has been accomplished in defiance of the hide-bound prejudices and conservatism of the old hindu religious systems prior to the time of the sikh gurus no general ever conceived the idea of raising an army from men who were believed to be unclean and polluted from their birth but the watchword and war-cry of the sikhs wa guru ji ka khalsa wa guru ji ki fata and the stimulating precepts of the tenth guru altered what had hitherto been deemed the dregs of humanity into warriors whose prowess and loyalty never failed their leaders the guru continued to address the assembled rajas how has your religious political and social status deteriorated you have abandoned the worship of the true god and addressed your devotions to gods goddesses rivers trees etc through ignorance you know not how to govern your territories through indolence and vice you disregard the interests of your subjects you place over them officials who not only hate you but are besides your mortal enemies in your quarrels regarding caste and lineage you have not adhered to the ancient divisions of hinduism into four sections but you have made hundreds of subsections and subordinate minor castes you despise and loathe one another through your narrow prejudices and you act contrary to the wishes of the great almighty father your morals have become so perverted that through fear and with a desire to please your mussulman rulers you give them your daughters to gratify their lust self-respect hath found no place in your thoughts and you have forgotten the history of your sires i am intensely concerned for your fallen state are you not ashamed to call yourselves rajputs when the mussulman sees your wives and daughters before your very eyes your temples have been demolished and mosques built on their sites and many of your faith have been forcibly converted to islam if you still possess a trace of bravery and of the ancient spirit of your race then listen to my advice embrace the khalsa religion and gird up your loins to elevate the fallen condition of your country upon this the rajas took their departure without accepting the guru's proposal to substitute his khalsa for existing indian religious systems a sikh called uday singh appeared before the guru without any offering he said he had one but was unable to lift it he had killed a tiger but was not strong enough to bring its body to the guru the guru sent for the tiger skinned it and clothed a potter's donkey with the skin the donkey thus arrayed being let loose frightened all animals and rejoiced in his unmolested freedom several complaints and requests to kill him were made to the guru one day the guru and some sikhs went to shoot him on hearing the noise made by the guru's party the donkey fled for protection to his old master the potter seeing the animal's behaviour and movements those of a donkey and not of a tiger and moreover hearing him bray approached him took off the tiger's skin gave him a sound drubbing and employed him as before to carry burdens 
the sikhs on hearing this asked the guru what he meant by such a stratagem the guru replied as long as you were bound by caste and lineage you were like donkeys and subject to low persons i have now freed you from these entanglements and given you all worldly blessings i have clothed you in the garb of tigers and made you superior to all men enjoy happiness in this world and the guru will take care of you in the next and grant you the glorious dignity of salvation when the donkey wore a tiger's skin he was formidable but when he fell into the potter's power he was beaten and a load put on his back in the same way as long as you preserve your tiger's exterior your enemies shall fear you and you shall be victorious but if you part with it and return to caste observances you shall revert to your asinine condition and become subject to strangers moreover i have made you really tigers and not merely given you their garb and it is for you not to resume your caste habiliments as i have raised you from a lowly to a lofty position by imparting to you spiritual knowledge so if you revert to evil ways and hindu superstitions from which i have delivered you your last condition shall be worse than your first for then there will be no hope of your amendment some sikhs went to the guru and told him that the rangars and kujars of the village of na had been plundering their property but that those who were armed had successfully defended themselves the guru took this as a text to preach to his people the advantage of wearing arms they who practised their use should develop their martial instincts enhance their prestige and defend their property while those who remained in the slough of ancient apathy should lose all they possessed but in addition to arms men should also come to him to be baptized and should for the purpose appear before him with their hair uncut with drawers daggers and complete armour and retain all these objects of defence as long as they had life a man named nand lal now visited the guru he was son of a vaishnav khatri and disciple of a bairagi at the age of twelve years the bairagi desired to put on his neck a wooden necklace one of the outward symbols of his sect nand lal refused and asked to be invested with the necklace of god's name which he might repeat to obtain future happiness the bairagi dismissed him and subsequently explained his action to nand lal's father he had not the particular necklace which nand lal had asked for and so he set him free to select another spiritual guide nand lal was an accomplished persian scholar there is a tradition preserved among his descendants that when the king of persia sent a dispatch to aurangzeb his chief courtiers were invited to draft a reply nand lal's draft was deemed the most suitable and it was accordingly selected for dispatch to turan aurangzeb sent for nand lal and after an interview remarked to his courtiers that it was a pity such a learned man should remain a hindu nand lal on being apprised of the emperor's desire to convert him to islam and ever thinking of the spiritual guide suitable for him decided to flee from court and take refuge with the guru he communicated his intention to a friend of his a high mohammedan official they resolved to go together to anandpur and place themselves under the guru's spiritual guidance nand lal presented the guru a persian work called bandagi nama in praise of god a title which the guru changed to zindagi nama or bestower of eternal life the following are extracts from the work both worlds here and hereafter are filled with god's light the sun and moon are merely servants who hold his torches 
if my friend thou associate with the holy thou shalt obtain abiding wealth evil is that society from which evil resulteth and which will at last bring sorrow in its train as far as may be remain servants and claim not to be master a servant ought not to search for aught but service hence my dear friend thou oughtest to distinguish between thyself and god even if thou art united with him utter not one word which doth not express thy subjection to him when mansur said i am god they put his head on the gibbet this heart of mine o man is god's temple what shall i say this is god's ordinance since thou knowest that god abideth in every heart it is thy duty to treat every one with respect though thy lord sitteth and converseth with thee yet through thy stupidity thou runnest in every direction to find him the omnipotent is manifested by his omnipotence sweetness trickleth from the words of the holy the water of life drippeth from every hair of their bodies the saints are the same without and within both worlds are subject to their orders they who search for god are ever civil courtesy pointeth out the way that leadeth to god the discourteous are beyond god's kindness in the following extract from nanlao's dewan goya a clear distinction is drawn between god and man although the wave and the ocean both consist of water yet there is a great difference between them i am one wave of thee who art an endless sea thou art as distinct from me as heaven is from earth End of section twelve section thirteen of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen life of guru gobind singh about this time the guru thinking that his kitchen was not well served paid a visit to it in disguise and asked for something to eat he received various refusals from the cooks one of them said that prayer must first be offered another we must first give the guru his dinner when the guru had received several similar excuses and nothing to eat though he urged that he was hungry he went to nand lal to beg his dinner nand lal at once brought forth flour vegetables salt and clarified butter and handed them to the supposed mendicant who took them and departed next day the guru in open court told how he had paid a visit in disguise to his kitchen and how he had been treated the cooks were very much ashamed and craved forgiveness he then gave orders that every wandering sikh who came to his door should at once receive food whether raw or cooked without excuse or delay the guru continued there is nothing equal to the bestowal of food blessed is the man who giveth to the really hungry let no one fix a time for the exercise of this virtue it is not necessary to consider whether it is night or day evening or morning whether the moon is dark or full or if there is a particular anniversary nor is it necessary to consider what the social position of the applicant may be avoid all delay in such a matter charity is of all gifts the greatest for it saveth life the guru had an opportunity of making further trial of the masands some sikhs of patna manjar and other parts of bengal came to see him these were accompanied by chaya and maya sons of balaki the masand of dhaka one of the sikhs presented a piece of dhaka muslin to the guru as an offering his courtiers began to admire it and said they had never before seen such a beautiful fabric on 
inquiry it was discovered that the same sikh had previously made a similar present through the masands to the guru's mother but it had never reached her chaya and maya were scourged as a punishment the guru heard that the rangars and gujars of a town called bajrur beyond the satluj had plundered some sikhs the guru took occasion during one of his hunting excursions to proceed thither with a small force the town was invested and exemplary punishment meted out to its inhabitants so that no one might afterwards be tempted to annoy the guru's followers a story is told which illustrates the sikh view of sacred music a sikh complained that the musicians on one occasion began to chant before he had quite finished reciting the sukhmani the guru said that reciting the guru's hymns bore the same comparison to chanting them to musical accompaniments as coarse pulse to sweet sacred food the gyanas supply another comparison and say that recitation is to chanting with music as well water which only benefits the owner of a few fields to rain-water which sheds blessings on all there is an anecdote told of a sikh who in the guru's presence mispronounced a word in the granth sahib and so gave a wrong meaning to the line in which it occurred the guru took the mistake as a text to preach the advantages of correct reading of the sikh sacred hymns o sikhs listen to what i have to tell you on this subject read the guru's hymns correctly there is the greatest advantage in such reading for it will ensure bliss here and hereafter if a hymn be written incorrectly correct it and then read it as one may mend and use a household article which hath been broken the man who thus correcteth not the guru's hymns hath no love for them it will be remembered that guru teg bahadur when in prison in dihli prophesied the advent of the english one day the conversation between guru gobind singh and his disciples turned on this subject his disciples asked him what the condition of the sikhs would be when the english arrived the guru replied the english shall come with a great army the sikhs too shall be very powerful and their army shall engage that of the english sometimes victory shall incline to my sikhs sometimes to the english as long as the religion of the sikhs remaineth distinct so long shall the glory of those who profess it increase but when the sikhs become entangled in the love of mammon think of nothing but their own children their wives and their homes when those who administer justice oppress the poor and take bribes when those who sit on carpets sell their daughters and sisters when sikhs abandon the guru's hymns and in lieu of them follow the shastars and adopt the religion of the brahmans when sikh rajas forsake their gurus and fall under the influence of the priests of other religions when they scruple not to consort with courtesans and allow their states to be governed by evil influences then shall the english rule and their glory increase the sikhs asked the guru what should become of the great empire of the turks the guru replied aurangzeb relying on makan oracles is destroying the hindu religion and in his insane career will stop at nothing short of a miracle he is even preparing to contend with me he respecteth not the religion of the gurus but we shall gain the victory and the glory of the turks shall fade away such of them as survive shall become common labourers and suffer indignities from their masters at the end of the sambat year eighteen hundred a d seventeen forty three the sikhs shall take possession of many countries three years after that sikhs shall spring out of every bush and there shall subsequently be terrible warfare between the sikhs and the mohammedans 
a powerful monarch shall come from kandar and destroy countless sikhs their heads shall be piled in heaps he shall continue his progress of destruction to mathura in hindustan and alarm many lands none shall be able to withstand him as prophesied by guru arjan he shall raise the temple of amritsar to the ground but the sikhs shall plunder his camp on his retreat from india in the sambat year nineteen hundred a d eighteen forty three the turks who survive shall lose their empire a christian army shall come from calcutta the sikhs who are at variance with one another will join them there shall be great destruction of life and men and women shall be expelled from their homes the sikhs who abandon their arms and join the brahmans against the english shall have great sufferings the real sikhs shall hold their ground and survive a sikh called khan singh was once plastering a wall and let a drop of mud fall on the guru the guru ordered that he should receive one slight stroke as punishment the sikhs exceeded their orders and several of them beat the man severely the guru on discovering this wished to make reparation and the reparation was to provide the sufferer with a wife the guru asked his sikhs if any of them would give his daughter in marriage to the plasterer all remained silent the guru said you found it easy to obey my order to strike this man why not obey my present order i find you are sikhs only for your own advantage it happened that at that time a sikh called ajab singh from kandar was present with his virgin daughter at darbar he said o true king my daughter is at thy disposal the guru complimented him and said o sikh thou hast to-day proved that thou art a true member of the khalsa the plasterer represented that he would not marry on account of the endless troubles attending wedded life the girl on hearing this said to him by the guru's order i am already thine if thou accept me not i will not wed another but remain here to do service at the guru's feet the guru then interposed and urged the plasterer to wed the girl he accordingly did so by sikh marriage rites known as anand the guru promised that he should have five distinguished sons as the result of his marriage a prophecy which was duly fulfilled the guru now became frequently silent a matter which caused his mother great anxiety seeing him one day alone she approached him and after the usual blessing said blessed am i that such a son hath been born from my womb but i am now anxious regarding thee people say that thou art completely altered explain why thy spirits are depressed and thou art no longer cheerful as before the guru replied mother dear i will tell thee my secret i have been considering how i may confer empire on the khalsa the guru prescribed convivial rules as a preliminary to his great enterprise wherever he had a kitchen it should be considered god's own and the sikhs should eat therefrom should any of them object on the ground of caste prejudice he should be deemed beyond the pale of sikhism before the distribution of sacred food a prayer should first be uttered after meals the first stanza of the fifth ashtapadi of the sukmani should be recited as a thanksgiving when a man had satisfied himself at the guru's kitchen he should take no food away with him when a sikh invited another to dine with him he should accept his hospitality and not find fault with his viands whenever a sikh was hungry he should be fed and treated with respect after this the guru prescribed some general rules for the guidance of his sikhs at the beginning of every work or enterprise they should recite suitable prayers they should always assist one another they should practise riding and the exercise of arms 
if the sikhs remembered the guru's instruction he promised to make all the inhabitants of india subject to them he who cast a covetous eye on his neighbour's property should go to hell he who assisted a sikh to complete any worthy or noble undertaking or study should obtain spiritual reward being questioned on the subject of marriage relations the guru uttered the following when i received understanding my father guru teg bahadur gave me this instruction o son as long as there is life in thy body make this thy sacred duty ever to love thine own wife more and more approach not another woman's couch either by mistake or even in a dream know that the love of another's wife is as a sharp dagger believe me death entereth the body by making love to another's wife they who think it great cleverness to enjoy another's wife shall in the end die the death of dogs once when there was scarcity in the land the guru's mother without consulting him ordered that food should be cooked only once a day and even then be sparingly distributed upon this the sikhs complained to the guru he said some evil persons have induced my mother to issue orders contrary to my wishes but o khalsa the guru's kitchen shall be ever open the turks shall flay those who have given evil advice to my mother the guru's mother on hearing this became much distressed and with tears in her eyes implored her son's pardon the guru pardoned her but added if thou close the guru's kitchen my curse shall avail but if thou keep it ever open my curse shall be retracted from that day forth twofold nay fourfold supplies poured into the guru's kitchen end of chapter thirteen section fourteen of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter fourteen a handsome young goldsmith one day presented himself before the guru and began to fan him he said that his father had taken the charan pahal in vogue at the time of the preceding gurus and he himself had received baptism according to the new rite the youth's mother accompanied him and the guru invited them both to stay with him the guru to make trial of the goldsmith's skill gave him ten gold muhars to convert into ornaments when the work was subsequently submitted for the guru's inspection he was pleased and ordered his treasurer to keep the young artisan supplied with gold and store all the ornaments he made from it in his treasury the guru asked the goldsmith if he had any faults he replied o great king i am the slave of thy feet i only seek the society of the saints upon this the guru replied he who hath great talents must ever possess some fault what is thine the man possessing talent who hath no fault must be in god's own image the young man however would not admit any imperfection after this he was allowed to take as much gold as he pleased to work upon it was never weighed to him and he was never asked how much he had taken one day the guru told his treasurer to weigh for the future without the goldsmith's knowledge all the gold dispensed to him upon this the treasurer weighed him out twenty tolas of gold when the goldsmith presented the ornaments made therefrom they were found to weigh only seventeen tolas upon this the guru ordered all the ornaments the youth had made since his arrival to be produced and weighed the treasurer found them to be far short of the amount of gold taken from the treasury on this the guru remonstrated with the young goldsmith thou impliedst that thou hadst no fault 
what greater fault can there be than to misappropriate what is entrusted thee didst thou not receive thy wages from the guru's house and was that not sufficient remuneration for thee thou art as evil as the masands whom i have been punishing i am pleased with those who though they may wear coarse garbs eat what they lawfully earn it is said that on this censure the youth reformed his ways the guru being asked by a devout sikh what he should do to cross over the world's ocean that is to be saved and obtain deliverance from rebirth gave the following recipe my brother repeat the name waguru eat what thou hast diligently earned as baba nanak hath said he who bestoweth a little out of his earnings recognizeth the right way bear no one enmity know that god is with thee at all times and remember death recognize the world as unreal and god alone as real a sikh went to the guru and told him that he had abandoned the world as it contained only trouble and anxiety he added that he had come in quest of rest and requested the guru to point out the way to him the guru congratulated him on having diverted his attention from the wickedness of men and inquired if he could read the sikh replied in the negative the guru then said it is necessary that thou shouldst read little or much so as to acquire understanding and improve thy mind thou shalt thus learn the difference between good and evil and what thou oughtest and what thou oughtest not to do there are besides many other advantages in reading thou mayest thereby obtain everything beginning with the knowledge of god the heart of him who is uninstructed remaineth in blind ignorance he who readeth guru muki is the best and obtaineth good understanding there is great merit in reading the japji and the other hymns of morning and evening divine service for they erase the sins of many births he who orally or mentally fixeth his attention on the name who worketh with his hands who gladdeneth the hearts of holy sikhs who ever performeth noble deeds and preserveth his mind humble is very dear to me and it behooves me to minister unto him the sikh expressed his earnest desire to learn if he could only find a tutor the guru appointed his own granthi or reader to instruct him when the sikh read as far as the line in the anand joy my mother that i have found the true guru he brought his tuition to an end and never afterwards pursued his studies the guru after some months asked his granthi how the pupil was progressing the granthi replied that he had not seen him since he had read that particular line of the anand upon this the guru sent for him and asked him why he had ceased to attend his tutor he replied that he had read enough and had attained happiness on meeting the guru the guru smiled and said even with this little learning thou hast obtained a knowledge of god and shalt eventually find deliverance the guru once asked his sikhs to tell him who was emperor of india in kabir's time one sikh said humayan a second alexander the great a third madame paul in short none of them could tell the emperor's name the guru made this a text from which to preach the advantages of knowledge as well as holiness and the good repute obtained from them in both worlds every one even down to ignorant women knoweth the name of kabir though he was only a weaver that is because he repeated god's name and practised true devotion 
sikandar lodi was then emperor but none of you even knoweth his name and there is no trace of him left in the world while kabir's fame is blazoned in every country and his memory is universally honoured wherefore members of the khalsa remember the true name serve the saints be humble lay your love and devotion at the feet of the immortal god and you too shall be honoured here and hereafter as the guru's power daily increased the hill chiefs thought it expedient to send a resident to his court who would inform them of his movements and proceedings a man called paramanand was accordingly selected for that delicate mission when he came to the guru he told him that his object was to be in a position to behold him continually and thus gain spiritual advantages he added that he desired to send the rajas occasionally accounts of the guru's good health and welfare and to preserve the amicable relations which already subsisted some sikhs asked the guru how kara parsad or sacred food should be prepared he replied wash and clean the cooking place then procure equal portions of refined sugar fine flour and clarified butter boil the sugar in water and render it liquid put the clarified butter and flour into another vessel and boil them until they assume a reddish colour then mix the liquefied sugar with the clarified butter and flour and boil all together when this is done a granthi must repeat certain prescribed prayers the mixture then becomes sacred food kara parsad and is fit for use the cook must be a sikh who has bathed in the morning and who can repeat at least the japji from memory a sikh married couple came to the guru in order to complain against their son they said they were satisfied with the wealth god had given them their only trouble arose from their son's contumacy he was ever in attendance on religious men and paid no regard to what he ate or what he wore if the subject of marriage so natural to a young man were mentioned to him he was ready to die as if poisoned when pressed on the subject he said that the guru had forbidden his marriage when they represented to him that the guru himself was a, a married man the youth would only say he can do what he pleaseth himself he hath forbidden me the guru sent for the youth and asked when he had forbidden him he replied o guru in the anand which thou wrotest as guru amar das for the instruction of the sikhs there is the following passage o dear man do thou ever remember the true one this family which thou seest shall not depart with thee it shall not depart with thee why fix thy thoughts on it never do what thou shalt have to repent of at last listen thou to the instruction of the true guru it is that which shall go with thee saith nanak o dear man ever remember the true one this instruction said the youth is imprinted on my mind the guru was so pleased on hearing this that he embraced him and said to his parents men are continually warned but none taketh heed blessed is he who hath forsaken mammon it is his good fortune that he hath awakened to contempt of the world this son of yours shall save both your families and you shall have another son besides to gladden your hearts the guru detained the youth and dismissed his parents he was pleased that the spontaneous love of god had sprung up in the young man's heart and he instructed him in the duties both of a husband and a hermit after a comparison of both he embraced domestic life 
once in the sultry weather as the guru was perspiring his servants took his bed from the ground floor to the top of his house from there he heard an altercation between two sikhs regarding a debt of seven rupees mala singh had lent this sum to lahara singh but the latter would not return it when at the suggestion of mala singh's wife lahara singh was further dunned he composed this couplet o sikh eat the wealth of a sikh without anxiety thou hast come to annoy me at which i am very angry and added a sikh shall receive whatever is written in his destiny mala singh replied thou embezzlest my money and then lecturest me thou forgettest what hath been said they whose acts are deceitful shall be punished in god's court death shall smite them they shall greatly weep and regret when they enter hell lahara singh capped this with another no one shall ask for an account as long as god pardoneth the guru overhearing this interchange of verses cried out they who live and spend money by deceiving others shall be bound in god's court ponder on all your acts so as to preserve your honesty the guru then quoted for the disputants the lines of baba nanak against dishonesty after hearing the guru lahara singh began to speak civilly to mala singh and promised to give him his money on the morrow lahara singh kept his promise and then went to the guru to solicit his pardon the guru upon this repeated for the first time his muktanama or means of salvation the following are its principal injunctions o sikhs borrow not but if you are compelled to borrow faithfully restore the debt speak not falsely and associate not with the untruthful associating with holy men practise truth love truth and clasp it to your hearts live by honest labour and deceive no one let not a sikh be covetous repeat the japji and the japji before eating look not on a naked woman let not your thoughts turn towards that sex cohabit not with another's wife deem another's property as filth keep your bodies clean have dealings with every one but consider yourselves distinct your faith and daily duties are different from theirs bathe every morning before repast if your bodies endure not cold water then heat it ever abstain from tobacco remember the one immortal god repeat the rahiras in the evening and the sohila at bedtime receive the baptism and teaching of the guru and act according to the granth sahib cling to the boat in which thou hast embarked wander not in search of another religion repeat the guru's hymns day and night marry only into the house of a sikh preserve thy wife and thy children from evil company covet not money offered for religious purposes habitually attend a sikh temple and eat a little sacred food therefrom he who distributeth sacred food should do so in equal quantities whether the recipients be high or low old or young eat not food offered to gods or goddesses despise not any sikh and never address him without the appellation sing eat regardless of caste with all sikhs who have been baptized and deem them your brethren abandon at once the company of brahmans and mullahs who cheat men out of their wealth of ritualists who lead sikhs astray and of those who give women in marriage with concealed physical defects and thus deceive the hopes of offspring 
let not a Sikh have intercourse with a strange woman unless married to her according to the Sikh rites. Let him contribute a tenth part of his earnings for religious purposes. Let him bow down at the conclusion of prayer. When a Sikh dieth, let sacred food be prepared. After his cremation, let the Sohila be read and prayer offered for his soul and for the consolation of his relations then sacred food may be distributed let not the family of the deceased indulge in much mourning or bevies of women join in lamentation on such occasions let the guru's hymns be read and sung and let all listen to them worship not an idol and drink not the water in which it hath been bathed the rules of caste and of the stages of hindu life are erroneous let my sikhs take care not to practise them o sikhs listen to me and adopt not the ceremonies of the hindus for the supposed advantages of the manis of ancestors my face is turned towards him who calleth out to a sikh wa guru ji ki fata my right shoulder towards him who returneth the salutation with love my left shoulder towards him who returneth it as a matter of custom and my back towards him who returneth it not at all to him who abideth by these rules i will grant a position to which no one hath yet been able to attain and which was beyond the conception of shankar acharya datatra ramanuj gorak and muhammad as when rain falleth on the earth the fields yield excellent and pleasant fruit so he who listeneth to the guru and attendeth to all these injunctions shall assuredly receive the reward thereof whoever accepteth the guru's words and these rules which he hath given shall have his sins pardoned he shall be saved from transmigration through the eighty-four locks of animals and after death shall enter the guru's abode if any very worldly man devoted to pleasure tell you to the contrary listen not to him but ever follow the guru's instruction end of chapter fourteen section fifteen of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter fifteen a sikh went to the guru to complain that his wife having been enchanted by a muhammadan desired to embrace islam he prayed the guru to perform incantations whereby his wife might adhere to her faith and conjugal duties the guru replied charms incantations and spells are useless the guru's hymns alone are of any avail no jinn fairy or demon shall approach her who daily reciteth or heareth the japji it is the duty of all sikhs to give their wives religious instruction thy wife on receiving it shall return to her religion and allegiance to thee one day the musicians were singing the story of gopi chand in presence of the guru the story being affecting the audience were moved to tears one man said that the musicians ought to be fined because they had in the guru's presence sung the epic of gopi chand instead of the hymns of the gurus and it was written in the anon that all compositions except the gurus were inadmissible the guru replied only those compositions are forbidden which lead men astray from god when simple men sing verses which lead to a reconciliation with him it is not thy duty to spurn them it cannot harm thee to listen to a story which containeth a moral 
the guru thought it prudent to be ever prepared for war and he continued to enlist all who offered themselves for service he provided them with horses and arms and often represented to them that the power of the turks had now grown beyond all endurance one day as the guru was on a hunting excursion in the dun balia chand and alim chand two hill chiefs seeing him with only a small retinue resolved to surprise and capture him a fight ensued but the sikhs were too few in number to cope with their assailants and were obliged to retreat a sikh trooper came upon the guru who had lost his way in the melee and thus addressed him as a forest hath no beauty without a tiger so a sikh army hath no ornament without its guru if thou assist us not in our present difficulty it will be a matter of eternal reproach to thee the guru then discharged five arrows at the enemy which took fatal effect upon this the sikhs though few in number were encouraged to return to the combat blood was spilled on both sides like red powder at the hindu festival of the holy balia chand on seeing the destruction of his men rushed forward but found himself opposed by ude singh one of the bravest soldiers of the guru's army alim chand also advanced to support the hill army but was confronted by alim singh both sides fought desperately and men fell like trees cut down by the woodman's axe alim chand aimed a blow of his sword at alim singh who received it on his shield and then with his return blow struck off alim chand's right arm alim chand however contrived to escape leaving balia in sole command of the hill troops balia chand did not long enjoy that honour as he was soon shot dead by ude singh the hill troops finding that one of their chiefs had fled with the loss of his arm and that the other was dead took to flight leaving the honours of victory to the guru and his sikh after the battle the guru undismayed continued his hunting excursion after this defeat the hill chiefs thought it highly dangerous to allow the sikhs to increase in power and number they remarked that the sikhs were to-day in thousands but in a short time they would be in millions therefore immediate measures ought to be taken for their repression an indian fig-tree when small can be easily destroyed but if allowed to grow it becomes a forest and cannot be eradicated the hill chiefs therefore thought it desirable to complain to the dili government against the sikhs the emperor aurangzeb was still engaged in warfare in the south of india in his absence the subadar or viceroy of dihli heard their representations the hill chiefs having traced the guru's history from the time he had left patna and settled with a humble following in anandpur thus continued knowing that he was a successor of the holy guru nanak we made no objection to his residence among us when he obtained power and we essayed to restrain him he went to nahan and there formed an alliance with its raja he then came into collision with raja fatah shah of srinagar which ultimately led to the battle of bangani where there was great destruction of human life after his return to anandpur the guru established a new sect distinct from the hindus and mohammedans to which he hath given the name of khalsa he hath united the four castes into one and made many followers he invited us to join him and promised if we consented that we should obtain empire in this world and salvation in the next he suggested to us that if we rose in rebellion against the emperor he would assist us with all his forces because the emperor had killed his father and he desired to avenge his death 
as we did not think it proper to oppose the emperor the guru is displeased with us and now giveth us every form of annoyance we cannot restrain him and have accordingly come to crave the protection of this just government against him if the government consider us its subjects we pray for its assistance to expel the guru from anandpur should you delay to punish and restrain him his next expedition will be against the capital of your empire this representation was duly submitted by the subadar to the emperor a kazi called salardin came to visit the guru reminded him of the sikh and muhammadan belief in destiny and upbraided him with having reversed the judgment of heaven they on whose foreheads unfavourable destiny was written he said have been blessed and have received from the all bounties and good gifts in return for their services and their fidelity the guru replied destiny is as the reversed letters on a seal i bless those who bow to the guru the letters of their destiny then present their ordinary appearance this shows that the sikhs need not implicitly believe in the controlling power of destiny in october when the cold season was approaching his troops represented to the guru that they required warm clothing he requested them to be patient a sikh he said was bringing him a bag of money to relieve all their necessities a rich merchant who had been originally a follower of saki sarwar soon arrived with an offering of two thousand rupees and related his story while i was a follower of saki sarwar i invested a large sum of money in merchandise but failed to dispose of it to advantage notwithstanding a large offering of sweets to my patron saint that and other mercantile ventures of mine having failed i set about finding a religious guide who possessed influence with the supreme powers i then heard that the tenth guru occupied the seat of the holy guru nanak and i vowed that in the event of commercial success i would give him a tithe of my profits i have accordingly brought this bag of rupees and i promise that i will no longer be a follower of any muhammadan but a sikh of the guru the guru duly baptized him and accepted his offering the guru was thus enabled to provide warm clothing for his troops and their devotion to him and their belief in his prophetic and divine power increased in consequence one day when the guru felt thirsty he asked a sikh to fetch him water before the sikh had time to do so a young boy who had come to see the guru volunteered to perform the service the guru noticing that the boy's hands were soft and clean asked him if he had any occupation he replied in the negative that was the first time he had ever offered to fetch water for any one when he brought it the guru refused to drink saying it was impure the boy remonstrated and insisted on its purity the guru replied hear me o sikhs it is an important article of the guru's faith that performing service for saints contributeth to man's salvation the hands are purified by serving them the feet are purified by going to behold the guru without serving holy men man's body is as unclean as the limbs of a corpse from which all shrink and which all fear to touch the guru quoted the following from gur das's wars curses on the head which boweth not to the guru and which toucheth not the guru's feet curses on the eyes which instead of beholding the guru look at another's wife curses on the ears which hear not and pay no attention to the guru's instruction curses on the tongue which repeateth other spell than the word of the guru 
curses on the hands and feet which serve not the guru all other work is fruitless his disciples are dear to the priest happiness is obtained by seeking the shelter of the guru after this the boy placed himself under the guru's instruction and, and learned to know god in due time the orders of the supreme government were received on the representation of the hill rajah's envoy to the viceroy of dihli an army would be sent to assist them against the guru if they paid its expenses but not otherwise they accordingly sent the necessary funds and further represented that they had no hope except in the emperor's assistance the viceroy sent for generals din beg and painda khan both commanding divisions of five thousand men and ordered them to take their troops to resist the guru's encroachments on the rights of the hill chiefs when the imperial troops arrived at ropar they were joined by the hill chiefs at the head of their contingents they decided to expel the guru if he offered resistance but if he undertook to be a loyal subject for the future they were prepared to allow him to abide in anandpur a sikh hearing of the force proceeding against the guru hastened from kiratpur to anandpur to give him information the guru's men were soon under arms he appointed the five whom he had first baptized as generals of his army the sikh chronicler states that when the engagement began the turks were roasted by the continuous and deadly fire of the sikhs the guru went into the midst of his troops and gave them every form of encouragement they never retreated but staunchly confronted the enemy general painda khan seeing the determined resistance of the sikhs shouted to his men that they were engaged in religious warfare and called on them to fight to the death against the infidels upon this his troops discharged clouds of arrows which obscured the sky painda khan himself formed the design of engaging in single combat with the guru and thus deciding the battle the guru on hearing his challenge advanced on horseback and said o pathan i am guru gobind singh the enemy of thy life on hearing this painda khan's eyes became bloodshot and he vowed to fight to the death against the priest of the sikhs he invited the guru to strike the first blow so that he might not afterwards have cause for regret the guru refused the role of aggressor and said he had vowed never to strike except in self-defence painda khan whirled his horse round and round to find an opportunity of attacking the guru and breaking his guard at last both warriors and their horses stood still and both sides began to speculate on their chances of victory painda khan discharged an arrow which whizzed past the guru's ear the guru ironically complimented him on his archery and invited him to shoot again so that he might have no cause for remorse painda khan discharged another arrow which also missed its mark upon this he was on the point of retreating through shame and vexation when the guru addressed him o oh, jackal wait a little whither goest thou it is now my turn the whole of painda khan's body except his ears was encased in armour the guru knowing this discharged an arrow at his ear with such unerring aim that he fell off his horse prone on the ground and rose no more this however did not end the battle din beg now assumed sole command and urged on his troops maddened by painda khan's death they fought with great desperation but were unable to make any impression on the solid ranks of the sikhs on the contrary the sikh forces caused great destruction among them ajmer chan seeing this prepared to for flight the other hill chiefs followed his example by this time din beg was severely wounded and began to ask himself why he should try to keep the field any longer since all those whom he had come to assist had ingloriously fled 
he accordingly beat a retreat and was pursued by the sikhs as far as ropar the guru sent an officer to recall his troops as he did not think it became sikhs to take the trouble to pursue cowardly and fugitive enemies the sikhs returned with horses arms and a vast quantity of other booty taken from the muhammadans the sikh chronicler states that the enemy's heads remained on the field like so many pumpkins and that kites ravens and jackals hovered round them impatient for a feast the guru continued to keep his troops in readiness for defence whenever attacked he sent for armourers to make muskets swords and arrows and filled his magazine with gunpowder and lead he issued a proclamation that all sikhs who came to see him should bring offensive and defensive weapons as offerings numbers hearing of his bravery and piety flocked to his standard he baptized all comers and thus infused into them the spirit of the khalsa the hill chiefs again took alarm and said to themselves that the guru who had defeated by inda khan and din beg though commanding an army of ten thousand men would be soon emboldened to oust them altogether from their territories they must therefore either kill him or expel him from anandpur and with this object they again thought it necessary to seek the assistance of the dhili government Raja Ajmer chand was deputed as envoy and it was resolved to provide him with costly presents for the emperor raja bup chand now raja of handur braver than his fellows opposed the dispatch of an envoy he said that nothing could be gained by again seeking the assistance of the emperor they ought to be able to defend themselves if all the hill chiefs concerned were to contribute reasonable contingents they could muster a large army which would be more than sufficient to annihilate the guru and his sikhs he however proposed as the most simple and feasible measure to invest the guru's capital anandpur and starve its occupants into submission should any hill chief not join in this enterprise the others were to hold no intercourse with him but treat him as an enemy the rangars and kujars who were their subjects and were at ancient enmity with the sikhs would now be valuable allies against the guru the raja of handur concluded his address o ajmer chan a reed is a frail support but a handful of reeds bound together is not easily broken if we all join together the sikhs will be powerless to offer us resistance raja ajmer chand was gained over by the proposal and both he and raja bup chand sent envoys to all the hill chiefs upon this the rajas of jammu nurpur mandi bhutan kulu kianthal gular chamba srinagar dalwal and others came with their contingents when they met in council raja ajmer chand thus addressed them hear me o rajas the sikhs are not merely my enemies they are the common enemies of all no one is able to withstand them they cannot even be bribed by money into submission we know not what their guru's designs may be he baptizeth sikhs and they beget sikhs as wicked as themselves we know not what the guru whispereth into their ears that night and day they think of nothing but harrying and slaying give me your counsel as to what you deem best to be done the rajas were unanimous in promising that they would agree to any proposal made by raja ajmer chand if the guru they said were put to death they might all reign in peace accordingly ammunition was served out to the allied army overnight and before daybreak all were on their march to anandpur on arriving near the city the rajas drew up the following letter and dispatched it to the guru the land of anandpur is ours we allowed thy father to dwell on it and he ever paid us rent but thou payest us not a single kauri 
nay thou hast originated a new religion and laid our country waste we have endured this up to the present but can now endure it no longer wherefore we have come to blockade thy town and destroy thee and thy sikhs this is the time for thee to pay arrears of rent for the occupation of our land we call on thee to do so and undertake to pay it regularly every year for the future if thou art not disposed to accept these terms then prepare for thy departure from anandpur or take the consequences to this the guru sent reply o ajmer chand thou and thine allied rajas desire to take money from me but my father purchased and paid for the land and now the only further payment you deserve is with the sword if you can deprive me of anandpur you shall have it with bullets added thereto seek my protection and you shall be happy in both worlds seek the protection of the khalsa too and abandon pride part not with your senses and come to terms with us this is the guru's house in which men shall be treated as they deserve it is like a mirror as men make themselves so they appear in it if you proceed to hostilities with the sikhs they will not allow you to drink even a drop of water now is the time for a settlement i shall act as a mediator between the khalsa and you you may then rule your states without apprehension End of chapter fifteen the life of guru gobind singh section sixteen of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter sixteen it was now abundantly clear to the rajas that the guru would neither make peace nor surrender next morning they beat the drums of war and as they had anticipated large numbers of rangars and gujars under one jagatula flocked to their standard the allied armies then proceeded with banners flying to anandpur in the van rode kesari chand the haughty chief of jaswan bearing himself it was said like a mighty elephant the guru prepared for defence and briefly addressed his men o khalsa i am ever your companion and succourer if you die fighting you shall enjoy all the happiness reserved for martyrs and if you survive and gain the victory empire shall be yours the sikhs were further encouraged by the arrival of five hundred men of the manja under duni chan grandson of bai salo a distinguished sikh who lived in the time of the fourth and fifth gurus reinforcements from other quarters also arrived at this conjuncture the names of the weapons served out by the guru to the sikhs are given with minute detail bows and arrows tage cutlasses katars small daggers jamdars two-edged dirks sarohis flexible swords songs pikes lances bhakuas daggers literary scorpions jambuas daggers scimitars selas spears pistols and muskets within anandpur were two forts one called fatagar the other logar the guru ordered his men not to advance beyond the city but remain as much as possible on the defensive sher singh and nahar singh each commanding five hundred men were told off to guard logar the defence of fatagar was entrusted to ude singh who received from duni chand command of the reinforcements of the manja meanwhile the allied armies advanced and fell on anandpur like a flight of locusts ajit singh the guru's eldest son now grown up to manhood went to his father to offer him military service he was however too shy to speak in his father's presence and requested uday singh to speak for him the guru replied that it was the duty of all true sikhs to fight for their religion their country and a good cause and he was glad to see his son adopting their hereditary profession 
the guru conferred on him the command of a company of one hundred and advised him as he was still inexperienced in warfare to remain behind cover and await events raja ajmer chand reminding his fellow chiefs that this was really the most important engagement with the guru advanced with his troops the hill chiefs opened fire with large guns on the guru's fortresses raja kesari chand of jaswan with his troops attacked ude singh's outposts arrows and bullets discharged from both sides fell like rain in the indian months of sawan and badan the rangars and gujars who appear to have fought with much determination were now reduced to half their numbers and showed a disposition to retreat raja ajmer chand went to jagatullah their leader and remonstrated with him he called on him to avenge the sack and destruction by the sikhs of the rangars towns of nur and bajrur jagatullah succeeded in rallying his men and they again began to fight with great valour ude singh on seeing this brought forth the guru's son and with a strong force led an attack on the enemy ajit singh displayed great heroism and address and the sikhs following his example chopped off the heads of the enemy as if they were watermelons the guru surveyed the battle from an eminence and continued to direct his arrows with fatal precision against the allied hosts several brave sikhs made a determined stand against the enemy and forced them to retreat on seeing this the allied chiefs held a brief council of war wherein it was decided to dispatch kesari chand to attack the right flank and jagatula the left flank of the guru's position while ajmer chand himself and his troops made a front attack on anandpur jagatula was soon shot in the chest by a bullet discharged from sahib singh's musket and fell lifeless to the earth man singh one of the bravest of the guru's sikhs arrived bearing the guru's standard and planted it on the spot as an indication to the enemy that the sikhs would not retreat a single pace or allow them to remove jaga tula's body raja guman chand now chief of kangra came and sought to uproot the guru's standard and hinder the sikhs from taking possession of the body of the fallen chief of the rangars upon this the allied armies rallied and then ensued terrific slaughter guman chand and his troops plied their arrows incessantly but failed to cause the sikhs to retreat the latter defended themselves until nightfall and retained possession of jagatullah's body the opposing armies then retired to their respective quarters for rest the guru complimented his son and sahib singh the slayer of jagatullah on their successful valour it is stated that the leaves of the sal tree were employed overnight to heal the injuries of the wounded the hill chiefs were in great dismay at the result of the battle and held a council of war during the night raja ajmer chand apprehended from the resistance offered by the sikhs to the removal of jagatullah's body that it would be useless to prolong the contest if they had the same ill fortune on the morrow there would be little left of the hill armies the raja of kangra professed himself ready to acquiesce in raja ajmer chand's decision the raja of mandi too was for peace and advised suing for the guru's pardon seeing that he occupied guru nanak's spiritual throne and there would be no indignity in appealing to him as suppliants the raja of handur however did not consider that any reason for effecting a reconciliation raja kesari chand of jaswan affected to despise the guru's power and promised to fight with more determination on the morrow and expel him from anandpur next morning when the hill armies proceeded to reinvest the nampur the sikhs offered valiant resistance the allied troops contented themselves with concentrating their attack on one particular part of the city the fighting continued with varying fortune until the afternoon when ajit singh prepared to renew the contest and requested his father to observe how he comported himself in it the guru counselled caution and forbade him to expose himself unnecessarily at the same time he sent thousands of sikhs to support him in what he declared was a war for the defence of their religion 
the allied armies rushed against them with the violence of a torrent issuing from the himalayas in the height of the rainy season whithersoever ajit singh discharged his arrows they were messengers of death when his horse was killed under him he fought on foot and inflicted great destruction on his opponents he communicated his martial enthusiasm to his sikh warriors with the result that the hill armies began to retreat raja kesari chand seeing this addressed them severe reproaches whereat they rallied and again began to ply their weapons at the same time the enemy now clearly saw that they could not overpower the brave sikhs but must trust to time and the starving of the garrison for the success of their enterprise the siege lasted for about two months with the usual incidents appertaining to that mode of warfare the sikhs at one time determined to remove the entrenchments of the enemy and put them all to the sword without firing a shot they accordingly made a night sortie in which several of the hill leaders were slain as the hill chiefs unsuccessfully prolonged the blockade raja kesari chand prepared to intoxicate an elephant and direct him against the city kesari chand compared the defences of the city to paper and sand which would fall to the ground at the touch of the elephant's trunk the raja of mandi again raised his voice in favour of peace and submission to superior force kesari chand however swore that if he did not take the fort by evening he was no true son of his parents all the future punishments attaching to great crimes against the hindu religion should be his if he failed in his enterprise he represented that in point of numbers the sikhs were not even as salt in the porridge of the hillmen when the guru heard of kesari chand's boasts he said that duni chand who had brought the reinforcement of manja troops was his elephant in comparison with whom kesari chand's elephant was as an ant duni chand however had no such confidence in his own strength and prowess and counselled peace with the hill chiefs he complained that the guru was violent and quarrelsome not mild and patient like his father he therefore advised the sikhs to fly from such a leader none of the guru's immediate followers would listen to such advice but duni chand succeeded in persuading the troops he had brought with him to promise to desert to dhir mal in kartarpur and adopt him as their guru the plan of escape proposed was to descend by scaling ladders when duni chand was in the act of descending his scaling ladder gave way and he fell heavily to the ground and broke his leg this interfered with his design of going to kartarpur to place himself and his troops under dhir mal's orders and he consequently thought it advisable to return to his own home in amritsar the next morning the guru after his devotions observed that no soldier of duni chand's contingent was present in reply to his inquiries his sikhs told him of the flight of duni chand and his followers during the night the guru calmly remarked he who hath run away through fear of death shall find death awaiting him at home the conduct of duni chand notwithstanding his efforts to conceal it became known in amritsar all the sikhs of that city were thus enabled to avoid intercourse with him and he became an object of social as well as religious detestation one night as he rose from his bed he was bitten by a cobra and died almost immediately his grandsons with his leading soldiers afterwards went to the guru to pray him to efface the stigma attached to the family a prayer which the guru graciously granted as proposed by raja kesari chand an elephant was intoxicated and prepared for the attack on anandpur all his body except the tip of his trunk was encased in steel a strong spear projected from his forehead for the purpose of assault thus arrayed and prepared for offence and defence he was directed towards the gate of the fort after him came the hill rajas with their armies they were overjoyed as they joined in the unwonted procession and made certain that on that very evening the fort would fall into their possession the guru asked vikatar singh one of the bravest and most powerful soldiers to become his elephant and he cheerfully consented the guru gave him a trusty lance and said as vikatar singh was prepared to resist the mad elephant so some sikh should now go to cut off kesari chand's head ude singh offered his services for the purpose and received the guru's blessing and a sword 
on this he dashed into kesari chand's ranks like a tiger into a herd of deer kesari chand's elephant was specially directed against the fort of logar on his way he killed some sikhs and so alarmed the sentries at the gate that they deserted their posts and fled within the city for protection vikitar singh found means of opening the gates and went forth to meet the furious animal he raised his lance and drove it through the elephant's head armour on this the animal turned round on the hill soldiers and killed several of them with the offensive weapons attached to his trunk some he trod under foot and others he impaled on his tusks so that he became a powerful ally of the sikhs the hillmen made great efforts to stop his career but in vain meanwhile uday singh continued to advance against kesari chand challenged him called him a great jackal and asked why he was fleeing from his fate uday singh vowed that he would take vengeance on him for all the sikhs slain kesari chand infuriated at his taunts discharged an arrow which lodged in uday singh's saddle-cloth uday singh on this dashed forward sword in hand and with one blow cut off kesari chand's head then posing the head on his spear he rode into the fort to exhibit it as a tangible proof of his victory upon this the sikhs rallied and cut off all the foot soldiers of the hill army within reach muhakam singh one of the guru's five beloved shore off the mad elephant's trunk with one blow of his sword the animal then hastened to the satludge to bring his pains and his unsuccessful career to an end by self-destruction what remained alive of the hill army now took to flight pursued by the bravest of the sikh warriors who slew them in numbers in this retreat the raja of handur was severely wounded by the brave sahib singh who thus added another to his long catalogue of triumphs on the moor the hill army rallied owing to the encouragement given it by guman chand the raja of kangra he disdained to retreat and called on ajmer chand to witness his prowess he said that death and life were the ordinary concomitants of warfare and bravely maintained that neither should be taken into consideration ajmer chand said thou art the pilot to take us across the sea of mourning we depend on thee to kill the guru and thus put an end to these protracted and unsatisfactory operations the raja of mandi for the third time counselled peace meantime the homes of the hill rajas resounded with female lamentation for their husbands slain kesari chand's ranis plucked out their hair for the loss of their brave spouse and heaped reproaches on ajmer chand as responsible for all this sanguinary and unavailing warfare on the following day guman chand directed the efforts of his troops against the city but the sikhs behind their embrasures and defences were fully prepared to withstand them the horse guman chand rode was killed by a bullet from the musket of alim singh there was a sharp melee round guman chand when he fell but his party succeeded in keeping the sikhs at bay and rescuing their chief the battle lasted with varying success until evening when guman chand as he was proceeding to his tent to take rest after the day's exertions was mortally wounded by a chance bullet all the hill chiefs now became disheartened and demoralized raja ajmer chand was the last to remain but he too left anampur and marched home in the dead of night ajmer chand notwithstanding the disastrous defeat of the allied armies determined to allow no repose to the guru as early as possible he dispatched an envoy to wazir khan the emperor's viceroy in sarhind to complain that the guru would not suffer his majesty's unoffending subjects to abide in peace he prayed the viceroy to assist the hill chiefs in destroying the guru's power and expelling him from anandpur another envoy was dispatched to the viceroy of dili to make a similar complaint the two viceroys then made a joint representation to the emperor against the guru it happened that at that time some wandering mimes visited the emperor's camp he ordered them to imitate the sikhs and they accordingly did so 
though their performance was obviously a travesty the emperor could very clearly gather from it the love the sikhs bore one another in popular estimation and he concluded that they had become a formidable power which it would be expedient to crush the viceroy of dihli had enough to do to protect the capital during the emperor's absence in the distant dakhan so orders were issued to the viceroy of sarhind to proceed at once with his army to expel the guru from anandpur End of chapter 16「Section 17 of Sikh Religion, Volume 5, by Max Arthur McAuliffe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of Guru Gobind Singh, Chapter 17 after the guru's victory over the hill chiefs his disciples rapidly increased and thousands of recruits were added to his army to enhance his style and dignity he ordered that his bodyguards should for the future be provided with arrows tipped with gold to the value of sixteen rupees each bai ram kaur came to visit the guru the guru's mother it is said had been expecting some holy man and was anxiously awaiting him the guru expressed the pleasure he felt to receive the representative of a family which ever since the days of baba nanak had been true and faithful to the guru and the sikh cause the guru baptized him and named him gurbaksh singh this man is principally remarkable for having it is said dictated to a scribe called sahib singh the work entitled sao saki some account of which has already been given one yoga singh came from peshwar to visit the guru and remained with him until the time for his marriage to a beautiful girl when he departed to his own country the guru unwilling to lose his companionship and wishing at the same time to make trial of his devotion sent a letter to be delivered him in the midst of the marriage ceremony it contained an order that whether yoga singh was standing or sitting sleeping or waking he should on receiving it at once return to the guru the messenger presented the letter when only two of the marriage circumambulations had been completed yoga singh at once stopped the marriage ceremony and forthwith proceeded to the guru on the way he plumed himself on his obedience and thus committed the sin of pride in further forgetfulness of the guru's teaching he on arriving at hashiapur thought he would visit a courtesan to drown in her company his regret for the interruption of his marriage whenever he presented himself to the woman a servant was found at her door to warn him away having waited until the early morning he at last bethought him that he was violating the commands of the guru and he consequently determined to proceed on his journey the guru smiled on seeing him when yoga singh told the sikhs the incidents of his journey they knew that he had been saved from sin by the miraculous interposition of the guru the guru about this time heard that a large imperial army was on its way to attack anandpur and assist the hill chiefs so he deemed it expedient to advance to meet them on open ground he accordingly went to nirmo a village over a mile distant from kiratpur raja ajmer chand and the raja of kangra said that now was their time to seize the guru he had no fort to protect him and no further means of withstanding them and it was not necessary to await the arrival of the imperial army both sides were prepared for battle the guru and his troops took up a post on an eminence and the hill chiefs also took up what seemed to them advantageous positions a fierce combat ensued in which the sikhs were ultimately victorious one afternoon as the guru sat in court the hill chiefs engaged a mohammedan gunner to kill him for adequate remuneration ajmer chand undertook in the event of the assassin's success to give him rupees five thousand and the proprietary rights of a village the other rajas too promised proportionate rewards the mohammedan assured them that all preparations for his design would be ready by the morrow
next day as the guru sat in the same place he was warned by a sikh of the plot against his life and advised to take precautions the guru replied how long am i to remain in concealment whatsoever the creator hath decided shall take place during this conversation a cannon-ball from the enemy's camp took away the servant who was fanning him the guru took up his bow and arrow and shot the gunner while in the act of reloading with a second arrow the guru killed the muhammadan gunner's brother who also was serving the gun on seeing these two skilled artillerymen slain the hillmen took to flight the muhammadans were buried on the spot called siya tibi or black hill and a votive temple was erected by the sikhs to commemorate the guru's escape the army of wazir khan the viceroy of sarhind in due time proceeded against the guru the guru now found himself in a very dangerous position between the hill chiefs on the one hand and the imperial army on the other he resolved however to defend himself where he was and his sikhs resolved to stand faithfully and valiantly by him they discharged arrows with fatal effect on the imperial troops as they advanced so that corpse rolled over corpse wazir khan gave an order to his troops to make a sudden rush and seize the guru the guru was ably and successfully protected by his faithful son ajit singh and his other brave warriors they stayed the advance of the imperial troops and cut them down in rows as if they had lain down to sleep in their beds the carnage continued until night rendered it no longer possible for the adversaries to see one another after a council of war held during the night the crafty hill chiefs represented to wazir khan that the cause of enmity between the guru and themselves was that he had tried to forcibly convert them to his religion they also stated that the guru had offered to join them in making war on the emperor whom he proposed to kill and whose empire he promised to transfer to them continuing their falsehoods they further informed wazir khan that they had spurned all the guru's offers on account of their loyalty to the emperor next day the imperial army and the contingents of the hill chiefs made such a furious assault on the guru's forces that he felt obliged to give way for him to return to anandpur would have been injudicious under the circumstances and would only lead to its destruction so he decided on retiring to basali whose raja had frequently invited him to his capital then marched in the van ude singh alim singh daya singh and mahakam singh in command of two thousand men they were accompanied by the guru's son ajit singh sahib singh marched next with one thousand of the bravest of the sikhs the guru himself took command of the rear guard the guru's departure was the signal for an attack by the imperial army and a general melee ensued in which dust obscured the sky cries of kill him seize him allow not the guru to escape resounded wazir khan bit his thumb and said he had never before witnessed such desperate fighting though the sikhs were escaping they were destroying his army he urged the hill chiefs to support him but they were unable to render effectual help until the guru's army reached the satluj there was stubborn fighting in which the brave sahib singh was slain the guru then told his men to make a firm stand while his son ajit singh crossed over with the baggage the guru with his troops then crossed over taking with them sahib singh's body the hill chiefs were overjoyed at being as they thought delivered from the guru they made presents of elephants to wazir khan and departed to their homes the guru having succeeded in crossing the river proceeded to basali and took up his residence with its hospitable raja wazir khan did not avail himself of his opportunity to pursue the guru but returned to his viceroyalty of sarhind after resting himself and his troops in basali the guru amused himself with the chase as of yore he occasionally crossed over to the left bank of the satluj and made dozen 
desultory attacks on ajmer chand's army one day during the chase the guru was met by an envoy of the raja of ba Baur. the raja followed close behind and pressed the guru to pay a visit to his capital the guru to the regret of the raja of basali accepted the invitation the raja of ba Baur had such faith in him and was so favourably impressed with the general repute of the excellence of his religion that he washed his feet and performed for him all the duties of hospitality the raja pressed him to remain with him for some time a request with which the guru complied a company of sikhs who had sought to make offerings to the guru represented to him that the rangars and gujars of kalmat had violently seized what they had intended for him they cried for justice in the name of the guru but the rangars and gujars heeded not their adjurations the guru found it necessary to punish these turbulent tribes who had never allowed him peace his troops disarmed them and captured and destroyed their fort the sikhs having now enjoyed sufficient rest began to feel time drag slowly their trusted leaders daya singh and uday singh represented to the guru that it was a disgrace to have evacuated anandpur the guru was not long in determining to return and ordered the drum to be beaten for the march the hill chiefs appear to have been unprepared for his return and offered no resistance the inhabitants of the city were delighted on seeing the guru again among them buildings were repaired and decorated and offerings of every description were made to the great spiritual and temporal leader it was one magnificent scene of rejoicing raja ajmer chand the guru's most persistent enemy finding him again firmly established in anandpur thought it expedient to sue for peace daya singh recommended the guru to return a favourable answer to ajmer chand's prayer the guru accordingly wrote to say he was willing to come to terms with ajmer chand but would punish him if he were again guilty of treachery ajmer chand was glad to have a promise of peace for a time even with the threat held out to him and he sent his family priest with presents and congratulations to the guru the other hill chiefs on hearing of ajmer chand's reconciliation with the guru followed his example and sent him tangible indications of their good will and friendly intentions End of chapter seventeen